This is part three of my Michael Manley interview. I've simply called part three Foreign Lands. When a young man looks for his purpose. What happened to your life after JC? Is that when you went to Canada? Yeah, I then registered at McGill University, was accepted, spent a day in McGill. But the truth is that you know, all Could of... Could you say that again? You spent one day in yeah, McGill? Yeah, I spent one day at, at, at McGill. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. You see, there were, there were, for a lot of people, the war against Hitler and Nazism and fascism was the nearest thing to a crusade at that time of our lives. Just as later on in my life, the anti-apartheid struggle became a defining crusade. And... You know, we, we were in a Jamaica that now was stimulated by my dad, by Never Soul, by Bustamante, by all the great events of that time. We were a generation who were intensely conscious of what Hitler was trying to do. And there is great attention and properly given to Hitler and the Jews. What did not escape our attention was Hitler and all so-called colored races that the implication of Nazism and the concept of the, of the Heron Vogue and the superior um, Aryan was this total rejection and repudiation of black people, of Africa, of everything that was not Aryan. Also it had its political implications and so on and so forth, so that I really went to McGill. But the truth is that in my heart I felt I wanted to be a part of that fight. So I joined the Canadian Air Force and. You know, I never really <laughs> made a contribution to the fight because by then we were too near the end of the war and I was childish enough to be disappointed when I had just completed my training in the Air Force and the war ended. <laughs> and I felt, you know, well, what have you contributed? You've contributed nothing but... But you trained to become a pilot. I started out that way, but by the time I'd got through all the preliminary training, I'd done quite well actually. It turned out they had pilots coming out of their ears. Mm -hmm. And after I'd waited for about <laughs> six weeks and you couldn't go at what they call a posting because they just weren't taking pilots. I said, what else can I do? And they said, well, we need navigators and wireless operators and things like that. So that's what I did in the end. But, but I don't think it was a waste of time because you know, I was glad the war ended, obviously. And I suppose I, in retrospect, I'm glad that I, I did not, in fact, have to endure whatever. <laughs> We're talking about the years 1943 to 1945. Yeah. After your experience in Canada, what When happened? I came home and spent some months as a cub reporter with public opinion, I went to every Edelweiss Park meeting to listen to Nethersoul and N.W. and Ken Hill and Frank Hill and Wills Isaacs and Glasspool. I would drive people to the meetings. And one of, one of my first memories was going as a cub reporter to West Kingston to see the Evans family, Gladson Evans and his daughter Irma and the others, who had just had their house burnt down by a bunch of, of, um, of not JLP then, I don't think the JLP was formed. Yes, yes, by JLP supporters. I remember them sitting there in West Kingston, coming events, casting their shadows, with their house burnt down in the background. And so I was very active in the PNP until I then left for LSE later that year. Is it something you really wanted to do, to go to the London School of Economics, or something you were yeah, encouraged we to do? Yeah, we chose it. You chose I it. I was interested. In, the thing that most attracted me to go to LSE was who I regard as the greatest teacher I ever met, Harold Lasky, who was one of the huge influences in my life. Why did Mr. Lasky have such a profound impact on you? Because of his message. Partly because he was an incredible personality. I, mean, I was very interested in a man who was one of the primary intellectuals and political thinkers of his time, who was an activist who became chairman of, of, of the British Labour Party, of, of the socialist movement in England. And so that intrigued me that a person would do both. And if you looked at him, he was the most unlikely political uh, um, activist you ever saw. He was a little man with huge glasses, uh, very much the, the little brilliant Jewish figure. And I just thought this incredible that a man could do that. And then he was the greatest teacher I ever met. I mean, when Lasky lectured, the whole of LSE, it was standing room only. Because the most intellectually exciting thing would ever happen to you in your life, his brilliance, 
his mastery of scholarship and his concept which was very powerfully egalitarian but profoundly rooted in democracy and you can see that all my subsequent life it is this search for how do you carry a message of equality, equality and transformation but never surrender democracy which is like a compass in my life. Your experience in England um, was not only with the London School of Economics, but I think you went out to, to Cambridge as well. You went off into the rural part of England, spent some time there, did you? Yeah, um, well, you know, I'd, I'd become a foundation member of the West Indian Students' Union and activist on the Caribbean Labour Congress, which was the body in England to speak on behalf of the progressive movement of the Caribbean. So as an activist from or late 1945, 46. And then at one stage, I, I gave up LSE because I thought I really wanted to be an art historian. And so I went to Cornwall, where my first daughter was born. I'd got married, my first daughter was born, to do a correspondence course to prepare me to enter the Patalon University in which you could be an art historian. And having done that for a year, I came to the conclusion maybe I better stay with the politics and economics and so I went back to LSE. What was it like <laughs> studying in England in those days and, and having a young family to contend <laughs> with? Well, <laughs> it was very <laughs> hard. What was it like then? Well, let me, yes, I mean, you know, money, you can be sure, money was tight. <laughs> and I remember I had a, an old port, um, royal portable typewriter and every middle of the month it was pawned. <laughs> See, of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get by, you see, you pawn, you, um, <laughs> you to do the, the, everything crazy you could imagine. I couldn't really afford to buy as many cigarettes as I like to smoke. So I got a pipe and I would save the butts and then smoke them in the pipe as a way of stretching the cigarettes. And, you know, <laughs> and every summer I'd get a job, one place for the whole of summer and then in the winter, I would get another job. Every winter, I know, I used to load mail bags, these 75 pound mail bags at a railway siding. And all this was critical to be able to keep enough food in the house. What you kind know, of father were you then? The first time, your first little one, were you doting? Yeah, <laughs> actually, truthfully, yes. <laughs> you look like you'd have been a doting dad. Yeah, Perhaps I think you still I've are. always been, always been. Are you still a doting father, you think? I'll ask her. Stories that I've heard of him in England with Rachel are really quite touching because um, Jacqueline, his first wife, went through a time when she wasn't too well. And he actually took charge of both Rachel and her first child from another marriage, Anita. And uh, he bathed and changed nappies and washed, washed, well, walked them in the, par in the park. And he cooked the Sunday roast if they had any money to buy a roast. Mm -hmm. And he did all these lovely special things. and. Uh, People wouldn't know that side of him necessarily. See what you're bringing out. That is why I want to do this interview. We know the politician, and I don't want that now. You can cook, sir. Tell me about it. Well, you still only, get your on, on, only, on, only under the lash of necessity. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's your favorite meal? If you had to go down into the kitchen now, what would you prepare? Well, what do I, well, I tell you the truth, I love saltfish and I <laughs> So that's what you'd prepare and, yourself? And, and don't, don't keep me too far from my saltfish fritters. Okay. <laughs> and run down. No, I, I mean, the things that I really love are part of that. I have two things. I had all those natural Jamaica dishes as I knew, knew them all my life is one stream of things I love. And the rest I have to confess, I love going like to a great French restaurant. I have no particular interest in between. So you spent those years in England um, you decided, no, I don't think I'll be an art historian, so let me go back to the London School of Economics where you graduated, you finished, and then you head back home immediately after. No, then, then, you I, had a then, day. then I worked, worked for a couple of years with the BBC. And that you don't talk too often about, why not? Well, what's to talk about? <laughs> what did you do with the BBC? I, I, really, I don't talk about myself much at any time. You, you're asking me. And I'm yes, and I, need, I want to know. What did but you do with the BBC? That I was on the overseas service where um, I did a range of things. Uh, every, every week I had a sports, a sports commentary program, I had a Caribbean news program, um, and uh, if there was a big thing like when they had the first big report on Federation, 
I would study it and do some analyses of it. So it was a sort of a range of things. You, know? you wanted to get no, a I comment in I here, Miss Manley. I wanted to comment on, uh, I think it started at the time when you were the West Indies West Indi Student Union, but you have to tell the story, Michael. David Kaur asked him to be best man at his wedding. Michael, take it. Please, um, because I have in fact researched that and if you didn't tell it, I would have been dragging it out of you anyway. <laughs> what really happened at that wedding, well, sir? The, the, the crazy thing is that I was absolutely terrified of speaking. In fact, I had never made a speech in my life. There's nothing that anybody could do that would get me to make a speech. I just was terrified. Shy, nervous, whatever you want to call it. And David said, would I be his best man? Because David was, had, all for years, has been my best friend. And I said, you know, you know I'd be honored to, but I can't accept because this is why I wouldn't accept the head boyship of JCI, because you have to make speeches. And I, if you really want to know, that's why. And, um, and I said, but David, I can't be because I cannot make a speech and best men have to make at least one of the speeches. And he said, but Michael, you have to be. So I said, well, I don't know. This is an irresistible force and an immovable object. What do we do? And we eventually hit on a brilliant solution is that I would be the best man, hold the ring, go through all the things. I'd even help serve the drinks, do whatever he wanted after. But we got Dudley Thompson to make the speech. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you too, in preparation... And of course, you know, Dudley has never had never a problem had a making problem speeches. speeches. <laughs> I tell you too, in preparation for this program, and uh, even way back, perhaps six years ago, I read something about you and one of your early speeches where you, you got up and you started and you spoke and you spoke and you spoke and then came time for you to end the speech you couldn't finish and you tried one way you couldn't finish you tried another way and you spoke and you spoke and after about several attempts you just sat down that's right <laughs> that was the first speech and that's exactly what <laughs> happened that's because you're and right. you know the only reason why i did this speech i'd come home as working with public opinion and you know you can imagine there's a lot of curiosity in the pnp you know, used to call me young boy in those days, young boy, I'll come back, you know, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So naturally, all the groups wanted me to come and speak. And I refused, and one day, mother took me aside and said, Michael, you cannot spend the rest of your life unable to speak. You have to speak. Accept the next invitation. So one came, Patriot Group East Kingston, and I said, you know, mother, the invitation has come, and said, accept it. And I said, oh, heavens. And when the day came, I couldn't eat, the night before, I couldn't eat. I was in a state, and she said, Michael, come here. And she gave me a tumbler of rum. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, just drink it. <laughs> so when I arrived to make the speech, the truth is I was as high as a kite anyway. <laughs> but it gave me what they call the Dutch courage. Yes. So I arrived, but I'd worked out a kind of a speech. But of course, in my total inexperience, I forgot the speeches have to have an end. <laughs> It was enough just to get there and say something, you know. And you were quite right. I, the absolute terror, although I was quite high, not so high that I couldn't be um, terrified. And I said, but how do I end this speech? I'm trying to keep talking. And uh, you're in the end, I sat down. He just and sat there down. was a stunned silence. And then I wouldn't put it as hard than polite applause. <laughs> My very special guest on Sunday special this Sunday is former Prime Minister Michael Manley. Once again, let me thank you for taking this journey with me. The parts will be there for you to listen to and re-listen and discuss. I know there's going to be a lot of discussion on this one. Well, coming up in part four is going to be trade union days. His trade union days, and he says it's the happiest days of his public life. Can you believe it? I think we hear a little bit about that Infamous strike, February 1, 1964, with two persons who were fired from the Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation. Mm -hmm. 